<clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. The Sacramento City Council will come to order. Um, let's call the roll and establish a quorum, please. Councilmember Ashby. Here. Councilmember Warren. Here. Councilmember Harris. Here. Councilmember Carr. Here. Councilmember Jennings. Here. Councilmember Guerra. Here. Councilmember Chenier. Here. Vice Mayor Hansen. Here. And Mayor Steinberg. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd ask Mr. Pecora, would you uh, mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Robert Pecora, District 7. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Jay. Let's begin with um, a closed session report. Mr. Ruyat? We have nothing to report, Mayor. Nothing to report. Okay. Very good. Let us uh, begin with public testimony for items not on the agenda. We have nine speakers, and uh, that's how we will begin. And then we will do the, uh, the Haiti initiative by Councilmember Schneer immediately after. Thank you. My first speaker is Cynthia Sperling, then Wind, and then Carol Korbs. senior homeless. Um, I'm presently in the Winter Sanctuary Program. It's interesting, but it does nothing to solve the actual problems. Uh, most of the programs that those people, people are being put in, you spend one week filling out the exact same paperwork that you filled out for the prior. Each one, you have to sign a paper, say they can share all the information. So why are we wasting one week in each program collecting exactly the same information? Why don't we do something to actually help people? Um, they do things like dangle carrots. We'll pay, the, we'll pay your deposit. We'll help you with the rent, but we're not gonna help you find a place. That isn't our job. And I keep running into that. And today I am here to actually, we discussed it, and we would like to invite, not you, we want to invite your parents or grandparents to join us. Have them come dressed in something they've worn for two days. Up until today, I hadn't had a shower in a week. There's no place to go. Um, have them show up. Nobody knows who they are. Have them see exactly what is happening. That would open your eyes to a lot of why things aren't being done, why they're not accomplishing anything. Thank you for, co Thank you for coming tonight. My next speaker is Wind, then Karen Korbs, and then Eric Frame. Wind? Wind. Okay, next. Karen Korbs. There's Are you Wind? wind? You're next, Ms. Korbs. <clears throat> Go ahead. The clock is ticking, brothers and sisters, and this is Armageddon. The homeless who are in our custody are dropping as though they are Donald Trump's dead mosquitoes on his janitor's fly swatter. Act. With my remaining time, I'd like to read something. Um, this is on uh, Quora.com. You can download the app on the App Store. Question, I don't know who posted this question. 
why is um, finding the roots of polynomials in mathematics important? Why is it taught to um, algebra students in high school? Here was my answer, which I haven't posted yet. Um, so here's my answer. Um, consider Hervériste Galois, a young Frenchman who died in a duel at the age of 20. He solved the problem of the fifth degree, but also started a paradigm shift in mathematics that led to an entire theory named after him uh, called Galois theory that only 200 living humans understand. He solved the unsettled greater than fourth degree issue at the tender age of 16 years old. He understood polynomials. Sir, your time is up. Thank you. Next speaker is Karen Korbs, then Eric Frame, and then LB. Mr. Go Mayor, ahead. Vice Mayor, and City Council. We all know that while the city and homeless advocates like to paint our entire homeless population as harmless victims who just need homes, many of us have discovered that a portion of the homeless population is involved in criminal activity. I was here two weeks ago talking about the homeless population that live in and around the WX and our drug addicts. Today I'm here to talk about the number of transient homeless in Sacramento that are also registered as sex offenders. In 2017, according to the Attorney General from the state of California, the number was 377. That's almost four homeless sex offenders per square mile, roaming the streets, the rivers, and sleeping on the sidewalks of our beautiful city. Now, if we drill further down just to the area around Broadway, between 5th and 24th Streets, where many teenage kids are hanging out, like at Willy Burgers, Starbucks, Target, McDonald's, Jamba Juice, etc. According to the California Megan's Law website, there are currently seven transient homeless that are registered sex offenders living along Broadway. Mr. Mayor, we have a serious drug problem among the transient homeless, proven by pictures that I shared with you two weeks ago. And now I'm here to share with you that we also have a homeless transient sex offender problem living on our streets and around Broadway in the WX. I'm a full supporter of the Sacramento Police Department and especially the homeless impact team. I have nothing but respect for them and the job they do, but many times their hands are tied. If they offer these individual services and they refuse and refuse and refuse and refuse again, then what? They continue to live on the streets posing a threat to all of us that live nearby. I am not comfortable having our teenage sons and daughters frequent the businesses along the Broadway corridor. I ask you once again, as I did two weeks ago, is this the type of city where you would want to raise a child? I thank you for your time and allowing me to come here and speak. Thank you so much. We hear you. Our next speaker is Eric Frame, then LB, and then Robert Copeland. Mr. Frame? Hello again. Um, that was an interesting testimony. I understand it. But I think the majority of the blame has to stand on you folks and um, poor leadership and corruption in California for quite some time. Um, just want everyone to know that we have been promised 1,000 tiny homes just now, recently, from Mr. Steinberg, within two years. Uh, we've also been promised that before, though, by um, one of the CERNAs, and we only ended up with 68 tiny homes. So let's make sure we actually get the 1,000 this time. Um, I would also like to see and piggyback on something Fago said a while ago, which is an audit of the homeless services, uh, so we can see a breakdown of, of that financial situation. Uh, we listened to Mrs. Sterling, and. She's not impressed with the services provided. Um, she thinks we can do a lot better. She's going through the system right now. Um, in her 70s, forced to sleep on church floors at the moment. Um, there's a lot of things we can do, solutions I brought last week. Mr. Steinberg, you weren't here, but I'll just repeat them. We have so many empty 
buildings in this town, the Hostess Factory, the Railroad Yard, Arco Arena, uh, that Walmart that was closed down the other day, the Sam's Club that was closed down. There's space available all over the place, space available, you see it everywhere. Lots of land just circled in fence and not being used. I say, yeah, let's call uh, an emergency because there's people dying on the streets and use some eminent domain on any one of those facilities to start housing people. Um, I think you guys should spend two days on the streets as well or in, by the river uh, just to make new friends down there and see what it's like. Try not to get rid of Okay. Uh, Your thanks. time is up. Appreciate it. My next speaker is LB, then Robert Copeland, and then Pastor Joan Kennard. LB. I honor my parents. I know you turned off now my, um, my tone, but yes, I'm here again to remind you that you do owe, uh, owe a lot to the city, uh, the Sacramento residents who are here. A lot of the dangerous people that we're talking about or the, the previous speaker spoke about um, being um, pedophiles and everything, many of them are indoors. So um, the, the people that are outdoors are the people that are in their 70s that have major medical conditions, major med uh, mental health condition. Yeah, why don't we get help for them instead of just warehousing them temporarily? Now, I do know that you said that you, um, you provided 30 homes, I guess, uh, semi-permanent, moving towards permanent homes for some of the people in the triage. Um, well, what happened to the rest of them? Um, some of them died. Uh, some of them just left because it was too dangerous for them to be in the shelter. They have talked to me about it. Um, at the, they have to go to the restroom outside. Yes, and they have to shower outside and, and then come back inside. So instead of cuddling up to just, um, you know, dogs and taking your, your P, uh, PR pictures, why don't you try to cuddle up and check out what it's like to be um, at the triage? Um, shelter and see um, the actual um, situation, the condition that people have to live in. Um, yes, we do need public bathrooms. We do need drinking fountains. And, you know, I do invite you to go ahead and try to make friends with some of the people that are living outside so that you can know what it's like to be out there having no place to pee or poop. You got 14 seconds. Oh, I still have 14 seconds, so thank you. Um, so, dogs don't have voices, but people do. And we will continue to voice the voice of uh, the Thank the you. Voice of the voiceless. Thank you. Next speaker is Robert Copeland and Pastor Joan Kennard. Robert? I want to talk to the people in Sacramento. Why should we uh, re elect any of the city council members? Are they doing an adequate job in Sacramento? I mean, rental prices are going sky high, the fastest in the nation by percentage rate. A lack of a housing being built, a, a terrible RT system. Uh, downtown, there's almost no uh, bathrooms or drinking fountains in the midtown and downtown areas. Why should we elect you people? I mean, really, get on the ball. Uh, where are the jobs? Have you ever seen uh, downtown midtown? What, have you ever walked down downtown and midtown, uh, Steve Hansen? That's your district. I mean, vacant buildings, uh, buildings under construction a uh, year and a half after the arena was built. I mean, really, get on the job. Either do your job or be replaced by somebody that can do the job adequately. Now, I'm talking to all of and I heard uh, one of the uh, city council members last week was offended when people criticized them. Uh, don't be uh, upset. Do you uh, better? Don't be uh, upset uh, that we're criticizing you. Do better. I mean, uh, what are you going to start opening up the bathrooms and get more drinking fountains and repeal the stupid anti-camping ordinance, which is doing nothing? 
except pushing people all over Sacramento. I mean, if you, uh, if you run them out of one area by uh, taking their sleeping bags, they're going to go somewhere else, and they may go in your neighborhood. They may go in the fabulous 40s or uh, Land Park or the richer neighborhood of Sacramento. Thank you. My next speaker is Pastor Joan Kennard, then Ron Elmsley, and then Elizabeth McDaniel. That completes the... That would be the final speaker for matters not on the agenda. Thank you. Good evening, evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and everyone. I will boycott Campbell Soup Products. They have no recollection of me being sexually harassed April and or May of 1993, according to Mr. Don Shannon. Monies need to be given to me. I ask for a large amount. It will be used for a legalization of prostitution. Of course, my bills. It'll help stop homelessness, rape, incest of mentally challenged adults, kids, and little kids, human trafficking, non-consensual sex. I never asked before the letter be the number four, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Great White Spirit. Yes, there's a trinity. Please boycott Campbell Soup products. Legislation of, of prostitution needs to get started now. I wish there was rig control. I wish, I wish, I wish to all 50 states in this territory and the world. Not, not anytime soon, but the universe and beyond will be a billion years old AD. Hugh Hefner said he didn't want to regret anything. The same I said to my Lord God. Father, I don't want to regret anything. I need a sexual harassment lawyer. Oh, where is a lawyer, a sexual harassment lawyer? President Donald Trump, be merciful to illegal aliens, especially everyone. Be merciful. You'll need mercy, too. Car insurance is hella high. Oh, chow, things are going to be easier. Ooh, chow, things are going to get brighter. I'm not going to put microchip in me, maybe cancerous. Allegedly, allegedly, Apple computer allegedly killed a 91-year-old male trying to get customer service. Ask their age. You'll be there one day. No such thing as hell. No fire and brimstone, no lake of fire, no worms crawling over Ma'am, your time body. is up, Pastor. Just your time, Your time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Ma'am, Anyway, thank you very much for helping me. Um, You're welcome, ma'am. Um, your time is up. Again, if we can, if we can help just, you. I if just want to thank you for uh, boycotting Campbell Soup products also. If we can ever help you outside of this particular forum, uh, we are happy to hook you up with uh, any of our um, expert personnel uh, to try to help you, but your time is up in terms yes, of the public Thank testimony. You. Thank you. My next speaker is Ron Elmsley and then Elizabeth McDaniel. Mr. Elmsley. This was in the Sacramento Bee a clip of a woman that was caught after about, oh, let's see, I think it was a half a year. Uh, this is very unusual. Uh, Hulicia um, Douglas was charged with the murder of one of the, let's see, what are they? I forget, but anyway, they're, they're brothers. And we very seldom see this. So many people get murdered in Oak Park, and we very seldom see um, a conclusion to it. Uh, Miss Douglas, she in April 2000 was uh, convicted of uh, weapons and shooting weapons in an inhabited vehicle, uh, vehicle, building or vehicle, and on assault with a firearm uh, the next time. Uh, who knows how many other gun um, incidents that she committed and that are not, uh, you know, they can't prove it. The officers in Oak Park say, we know who's, who's doing it or we know who did it, but we can't prove it because people in Oak Park just don't talk. So this is, uh, this is what we hear repeatedly and repeatedly. So this is a, a monumental um, step forward, I, I guess you would call it a, uh, well, anyway, I forget. Eh. Um, 
I heard that uh, you, you gave a, I think it was a 5% raise to the uh, local 225 two, two represent um, or something, the, the firemen's. Yep. Now, we needed that money in uh, crime prevention. These people have sucked the, the city dry. Now they're, they say they're, they can speak with the city manager, but uh, th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. You're welcome. Our last speaker is Elizabeth McDaniel. Close the game. Thank you. Is it good? Can we see that? It's kind of sideways. Okay, please help her. This was straight up? Can you see it? Here you go. We can see it, ma'am. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, last week I was here um, and I exposed the um, Nadis that are in presently in all eight districts here in Sacramento, specifically Point Natomas, get the symbol. Um, the first time I was before the Council was regarding the water quality at the Point Natomas apartments. The response from the water um, quality was a cover-up by one of the Nadis manipulating the computers to reflect an untruth in the utilities office. It was stated that the city had installed meters on that day, and yet this would not change the, uh, have a drastic change in the water quality, and nor were any of the tenants um, notified that that would be the case, why the water was turned off unexpectedly. In fact, after I had the meeting with the manager and supervisor regarding the water quality, um, when I arrived back at the property at the corner of Binghampton and San Juan, there was a meter there, and it was a cone to, uh, set by it to make it extremely obvious that, that I just could not um, ignore it. And so if it was something installed, it was on that day. Um, and um, I just want to make a correction to what I said regarding the assault that I, ha I experienced in Ceres, California by eight cops. Um, it was not 6-6-2014, it was 6-3-2014. And um, that, that was my inverted response to them, 3-6-2018. Um, um, and so just please help the homeless. The homeless have reported to me, I don't know for what reason, um, there's a lot of guns coming in on trains. They go on trains, they say, um, that Trump, but I, this is a democratic state, uh, 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 California, and so um, what's really going on? You know, they're really afraid, they're frightened, they believe they're getting ready to be round up and put somewhere that's um, not pleasant, like a Nazi concentration camp or something, so can you please help the homeless as well? Thank you, Ms. McDaniel. You're so very welcome. God bless you. Oh, District 3, Jeff Harris. Uh, Council Member Warren, did you, did you request to speak? You were punched up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I, I, I did. There was a gentleman who came in just a little bit late, and he ha he wanted to speak on an important topic. And I know we are enacting or trying we, to follow. Yeah, we have a rule: the so. speaker slip has to be turned in at the beginning. But would you like us to? Would you like to request an exception to that for this? Uh, purpose. You know, since he came in yeah. in, in the weather, I'd, I'd like to request a, we have, an exception uh, if we can. We have four other people who also turn in their slips after the fact. Okay. So I don't know. Um, is is there a will of the council on all five of them? All right. Um, if that's the will of the council, then we will suspend our rule. Um, yeah, I'm only asking for the night too, so it doesn't have to be an ongoing. It's okay. Yeah. Um, Madam Clerk, do you have the slips? Um, in the future, I think uh, one of the things we can consider for our policy for this purpose is if we want to as a council, we can vote to suspend our rule. I think it's been our custom to just uh, take their requests. Um, but uh, Madam Clerk, why don't you proceed with the four speakers? Thank you. I have, I have three more. Mac Worthy, Jeffrey Tagasi, Targia, Targia, and then uh, Malachi Amun. Uh, Mac. Mac Worthy. Mr. Worthy? Mac, Mac you submitted a, a speaker slip for comments on matters not on the agenda. Who's after Mr. Worthy, Madam Clerk? Uh, Jeffrey Tardigia, you're next. Yeah, see, but, but we are here. We, uh, I stand here and I tell you all things, and you all just ignore it and don't try to help the public at all. I told you the Department of Justice is going to file the suit here. And people, you out here, go to the federal building and get in on the suit and do your testifying there. Because when you violate the, the Constitution 
of America, you should go to jail. The woman in Oakland, when you hide in the future, that's a felony. And if you go over there and enough of you go over there and testify, you won't have to recall these people here because a felony will be filed against them and they can't do nothing up there until they prove that they're not leading you in a different direction. That's why I want you to go. If people, I would uh, like to see uh, Trump put U.S. Marshals in here. Line it up with U.S. Marshals, plain closers. Because when you start hiding futures, that's sad. Uh, Scott Jones, stay where you're at. You support it. Don't mess up this little black boy here as chief. Because, see, it's, it's critical that we saw something happening here about his mom in a party in the park. His mom was nobody in no park. But don't pat that boy's back. Let him stand as a man. Because we're going to need it. And we got to look at uh, situations of legal California cities, the lobbyists. That's reading that situation in Oakland. That's where that money went. Now, I worked for people that was in Oakland Hills. There's a case left here. That's a $500,000 house, which that lawsuit was right here in this library, which the janitorial service was building this library for something that they wasn't doing. But we have to sit down and look at the government got to get involved here. Because when you are denying to recognize federal law, put all of them in jail, y'all too. State, the governor, put them in jail. You have to worry about recalling these people because there's no process to get them out from up there unless the D Department of Justice prove a felony against them and they automatically got rid of them. Get on it, get over there and talk to the people about it and see can you testify. And that will be testimony. This is here is uh, venting your grievance here. Thank you, Mr. Worthy. Uh, Mr. Turdigay, we have the microphone for you if you want to come over here. Thank you, Nell. Thank you. Uh and thank you, Steve, for your assistance the, uh, today where uh, somebody explained to me about the 311 app um, so that the Broadway and 34th Street that I brought up at RT's board meeting will probably be fixed. But after I left Rick last night and Mike and I went up to um, go up to Sutter um, Hospital and the 30 light rail, uh, I'm sorry, 30 bus stop, we had two uh, officers come by with an individual and we see sat down there and was, we've got to get this guy to West Sacramento. So he gave this individual two bus passes. Bus was late, this was at 6.57 last night. Bus was late, it was after 7.07 .07 before the bus arrived. I said, you know, I won't get on, you explain to the bus driver what you need. And that was to the driver explaining that this individual needs to go over to West Sacramento. Well, this individual had already attempted three times to walk away from these officers. Mike Bombam and I got him, he was on board, and we said, stop, don't leave. He tried to leave at Sutter, um, should we say, uh, um, Sutter Fort. He tried to leave at um, 14th. He tried to leave basically every two or three blocks. But Mike left at 14th Street where the detour took place, and I got him over to the Capitol. Um, and that's where we let him off to get to West Sacramento. I believe we need to come up with a better policy, and I will explain this to Sacramento um, Steps Forward tomorrow morning, again, because um, dealing with these releases from Sutter Hospital and others, you need to have a better procedure about what you do and how these people are allowed, because it shouldn't be the RT operator that has to try and control an individual. We did the controlling to get it delivered. Other thing you have is a few other points, but my time is up. So thank you, Jeffrey. Another matter. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker on comments on uh, matters not on the agenda will be uh, Malachi. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mr. Vice Mayor and members of the council. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. I have the unfortunate task of. Um, of reporting that the implementation of our city's equity program for cannabis, cannabis opportunity, reinvestment, and equity that all of you so uh, graciously uh, supported, unanimously supported on November 28th. Uh, the situation is we have uh, uh, the city still approving permits uh, as the implementation of the equity program uh, is delayed, uh, and it's delayed because of a study that we asked for last year. We struggled for an entire year to 
uh, have a, a study completed, an, a social equity analysis completed uh, last year uh, that was always, for some reason, a low priority. We we're told that we have police department data, and so we don't need to complete a study. Uh, so post November 28th, moving into implementation, uh, and just a few weeks ago, we were surprised during a meeting in the city manager's office that a study is now required as a legal underpinning to go forward with the implementation of the core program. And so that further delays um, progress and um, uh, you know it's an issue and would like to ask that the council consider uh, making a motion uh, to press pause on further uh, uh, permits being approved until uh, the equity program is fully up and running. Uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have a special presentation by Council Member Chenier next. Council Member. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, so most Friday nights I get to do the Peace Walk in Oak Park, and one of the really nice uh, kind of side benefits of that is you get to meet all kinds of folks uh, doing different things. And it, so it's always good to kind of expand your horizons. And maybe a month, month and a half ago, uh, I was walking in and started to hear about an initiative in ha that we're doing with Haiti. And so uh, I wanted to bring some folks up to, to briefly talk about that and show what we're doing. <clears throat> Great. So, uh, Welcome. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, hello, members of the City Council. My name is Robert Cabanes, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of City Church of Sacramento and Sister Cities Haiti regarding our Haiti initiatives. Uh, we hope to get you up to date on our efforts, as well as uh, show you the value that they bring to both Sacramento and Haiti. And we're doing this in hopes that you will support and further our efforts by recognizing the city of Gonaive, Haiti as a friendship city of Sacramento and eventually as a sister city of Sacramento. Uh, but before we get right into it, I wanna give you a little bit of background on the nation of Haiti. Uh, think back to your earliest recollections of uh, lessons on US history. And you might recall that they began not with the Mayflower, but with Columbus's conquest of what became known as the island of Hispaniola, of which Haiti comprises a third. Haiti, which of course is the original name of the island before Columbus came. So what we probably weren't taught as kids is that long before Harriet Tubman was liberating slaves through the Underground Railroad, many African-American slaves who worked as deckhands achieved their freedom by fleeing to asylum once those ships arrived in Haiti. <laughs> Heads of state Christophe and Pechon offered rewards to any mariners who intercepted ships and then brought those slaves to Haiti where they received their freedom. You see, the Haitian slave rebellions gave birth to the Haitian Revolution, which ended slavery 60 years before it ended here in the US. So in effect, Haiti, for many oppressed Americans, was the first sanctuary state. So Haiti is still paying this fine today and remains the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, a fine that amounts to $20 billion US currency. So it's the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, but it is a nation rich in culture, a culture that we celebrate at every Jazz Jubilee, Mardi Gras Festival, and with every taste of Creole cuisine. Um, and I hope that those mutually beneficial exchanges will continue. So now, I'd like to direct your attention to the screen behind you. Sacramento, Gonaive, Haiti, the city of compassion and the city of independence. In the summer of 2016, City Church of Sacramento sent a team to rural Haiti where less than half of the population has access to potable water. The team drilled a well and installed a pump that provided clean water to 450 people in the community of La Plange. Moved by the experience, members resolved to establish a permanent relationship with the people of Haiti. Thus began a partnership with Sister Cities Haiti and the formation of the Gonaive Committee. Community roots and local operations. Of course, I mentioned that our committee operates out of City Church of Sacramento that's located on the corner of 39th and 4th Avenue in the community of Oak Park. And we're active, uh, active observers within the Sacramento Sister Cities Council. Here's a, a picture showing a little bit of the sweat equity that we've put into the Sister Cities Friendship Garden located at the South Natomas Community Center. Um, 
As you can see, uh, I probably lost a few pounds there and inches off my waist, and I have a personal issue with that Bermuda grass. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a picture of uh, a few of our committees who came to pitch in on this uh, cleanup day, and this is the edited picture. This is the unedited picture, and I assure you that there were uh, no child labor laws broken in the making of that garden. We are also part of the Sacramento Caribbean American Association. You've seen some of the events that we participate in, such as the Banana Festival. Here's a picture uh, where our leadership is they're receiving a, an award from Senator Richard Pan's office for the good work done in the community. Here's a picture of a few of the books that were donated to us by the Alliance Francaise, as well as the Joie de Lire French Book Club of Sacramento for our Go Naive Sister Cities Library that we will be building soon. Here's the conclusion of a successful meeting that Mr. Doris and I had with the president of Sac State, Mr. Nielsen, his chief of staff, the provost, as well as two members uh, of the international programs and global engagement team at Sac State. And we're now well on our way to rolling out student exchanges with Go Naive. For our local action, this is a resolution, some of you might recognize it, uh, recognizing the legacy of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. And perhaps it's a lesser known fact, but Dr. Du Bois was the first black person to graduate from Harvard with a PhD. He's also the co-founder of the NAACP and son of a Haitian immigrant. Here's a panel discussion that we put on, and this is a clip from the Sacramento Observer about that discussion, the man in the forefront, I know the picture is blurred, but that is uh, Dr. Stan Olden. He's a professor of government at Sac State where he teaches politics of the underrepresented. I will now turn it over to our student coordinator, Mr. Darius Tamani, who actually traveled to Haiti to meet with officials to talk to them about our efforts. Thanks, Robert. Mr. Mayor, members of city council. So I'd like to give everyone a brief background. So, Besides our local effort here in Sacramento, we also have an international base of operations located in uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Now, this is where we coordinate all of our sister cities efforts, and specifically for Haiti. Janelle Jerome is our international coordinator for all Haiti projects. He's the one who actually put me in contact with local officials on the ground in Haiti, as well as helping me coordinate my travels to and from the country. So additionally, we have an international base of operations located in Fort Lauderdale. This, of course, is the capital of excuse me, um, Port-au-Prince, which is the capital of Haiti. Uh, it's not only an important city because it's the capital, but because it's one of only two cities in the country with an international airport. Now moving on, I'd like to briefly give you guys some background on the city of Gonaïf. The city of Gonaïf currently has a population of around 300,000 people. It's located next to the Atlantic Ocean and is bordered by a small coastal mountain range with a large agricultural belt surrounding it. Now, the main base of the economy in Gonaïf is based in subsistence farming and agriculture. The three main cash crops in this region are bananas, rice, and beans. Rice is incredibly important in this region because it's not only a staple in the Haitian diet, but is also exported to the greater Caribbean region. Now, the original town of Gonaïv was founded in 1422 by the native Taino people. The Taino inhabited not only the island of Hispaniola, which includes Haiti and the Dominican Republic, but also islands in the greater Caribbean, like Cuba. Now, the Taino lived in these regions pretty much uninterrupted for hundreds of years until the Spanish um, colonized this region and occupied it in 1492. Now, from 1492 to 1525, it was occupied by the Spanish, but in 1526, the French kicked them out and occupied until 1804. Now, in the late 1700s, a man named Jean-Jacques Dosseline led Haitian slave revolts against their French colonial masters and the armies under the control of Napoleon at the time. He led some very decisive battles and won these battles against the Napoleonic forces and defeated them and kicked them out of the island in 1804. Now, it was actually in the city of Gonaïv where Dosseline actually declared Haitian independence from France and declared the first black republic in the world. He would later go on to be the first ruler of Haiti. Now, skipping forward a couple hundred of years, Gonaïv currently has two universities. The first is the Public University of Gonaïv, also known as UPAC. This university offers degrees in education, business management, as well as nursing. There's a second university, and this one's private. It's the Gonaïve School of Law and Economics, and like the name implies, offers degrees in both law and economics, but as well as government and international relations. So during my time in Haiti, I met with a few officials. 
The first person I'd like to mention is the city manager at Cheska Corville of Gonaive. He was an extremely welcoming individual. He not only introduced me to local government officials, but also officials in the surrounding communities as well. I'm sorry to interrupt. How much more of your presentation do you have? Um, about five more minutes about. Two more minutes? Okay, I can skip forward a little bit. So some brief uh, relevant international documents. The first was a mayoral letter expressing interest in a sister city's relationship between Gonaive and Sacramento, and they invited a representative to come to the city itself. This was actually sent to us in 2016, but we didn't have a representative able to travel at the time. It wasn't until 2017 when I met Robert and he extended an invitation uh, inviting me to travel on behalf. So in January of 2018, I went ahead and went to Go Naive. I spent time with local officials there and got to know the Haitian culture and the people very well. I was able to return with a second letter, and this letter is a letter of recognition of my visit and an invitation from Gonaive city officials to work with Sacramento city officials. We have it here today framed, signed by the mayor, and we'd like to present it to the city council and the mayor after we conclude our presentation. So moving forward, in 2016, they sent us an invitation. In 2017, I met Robert at Sac State. And in 2018 of January, I traveled to Gonaive and met with local officials. So today, I'd like to ask, respectfully ask the mayor and the city council for two things. One establishing a friendship status between the city of Sacramento and Gonaive in the form of a council resolution or a mayoral proclamation. And second, extending a formal invitation to the city officials, including the mayor and the city manager of Gonaive, inviting them to Sacramento. This would be an amazing opportunity to not only reciprocate the offer they sent us in 2016, but allow city officials from both respective cities to meet and discuss in furthering this international commitment. So with that being said, I'd like to conclude our presentation. I'd like to thank the city and council mayor for allowing us to speak on behalf of Sister City Sacramento, and we'd love to answer any questions either now or later, if you guys have any. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, council member. Great, thanks very much. Uh, it's much appreciated, and I think that we can follow up on these items, and uh, it's always good to know that we're, we're not only doing what we're doing here in Sacramento, but we have uh, kind of a, a reach outside of this, and what we can learn from sister cities around the, around the globe is always important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, the consent calendar. Consent calendar is on items one through seven, and I have no speakers on the consent calendar. Yeah. We have a motion from Mr. Guerra, second from uh, Council Member Chenier. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain, oppose, sorry, oppose, abstain. All right, motion passes unanimously. Uh, next item, Madam Clerk. The next item is number eight, weed and rubbish abatement. All right, let's open the public hearing on item number eight. I do have two speakers on this item. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. This will be very brief. <clears throat> My name is Jose Mendez. I'm the Code Enforcement Manager. I'm here to recommend that this council authorize a community development to abate weeds, rubbish, refuse, <clears throat> and dirt from properties constituting a public nuisance and consider all objections and comments related to this item. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, yes, I'd like sir. to uh, move to close the public hearing and adopt the staff recommendation. We do have two speakers on the item, on the rubbish item. Uh, so the first, <laughs> first speaker is Bob Pecora. And then Mac Elworthy. Mr. Pecora, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I think some of you probably recognize my face. And I've talked to most of you one way or another. I uh, wanted to talk about the, this problem of uh, garbage in the street, at the curb, and weed abatement uh, on a piece of property that I own in South Sacramento on Luther Drive, about three quarters of an acre in which I'd like to build a uh, housing project for senior citizens, and it's going through the city process right now. To put eyes on the street, uh, it would help abate the problems of people cutting holes in the chain link fence that I put up and camping out and bonfires. It would help amid, mitigate uh, kids shooting drugs, but it would also help mitigate uh, where people come and dump garbage on the street, at the curb, and on my property. And this kind of garbage is construction debris, it's chunks of concrete, it's refrigerators, stoves, beds, tires, you name it. 
And it's, it's a constant problem that I've been wrestling with for years. And I would hope that uh, it also exacerbates the weed abatement problem because now weeds grow around this stuff and under this stuff and on this, these items have to be constantly removed to just get at the weeds, to cut the weeds down. So it's, it's a really difficult situation. Uh, I've talked to the police about it and they do have a POP program, uh, but that's only very limited. And so uh, the chain is only as good as its weakest link. And I would hope that the city could adopt uh, a program or procedures or some way to mitigate these types of things. We even have big trucks that park there, even though it's no parking zone. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's not in the city's best interest to let things like this fester because Thank now you. you have rodents and uh, other types of problems that, that create, uh, created. Mr. Picard, time is up, but can we look into this request, please? We'd appreciate it. Any, res you. any response off the top here in terms of trying to respond to Mr. McCor McCorris? Uh, the city does have an illegal dumping program, and it's something that we definitely would investigate. Um, and we are more than happy to work with property owners if, if something is dumped on their property. Okay. Please, can you continue that discussion? I'd appreciate it. Mr. Worthy. Yeah, before you leave, Mr. Yes, Carr. Mr. Carr. And Bob, Councilman Carr. The, uh, yeah, we want to have well, Hold on, Mr. Worthy. Hold on here. We got Council Member Carr's got a question from Mr. Uh, Pecora. Uh, yeah. Where you leave. Uh, dumping is a constant problem uh, all over the city, and no, especially all over the district as well. So uh, we purchased five cameras that we're going to place in positions have that have habitually been the uh, areas where things are being dumped. Okay, we're it's working fine. with code enforcement to identify those locations. Permission to approach and the bench. <laughs> We will move those cameras around to those areas. Mission granted. And if you're getting a lot of dumping, you'll get one of those cameras. <laughs> oh, okay, there yeah. we go. Mr. Worthy, we'll continue offline. Very good. Every meeting brings a new experience. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Worthy, what's uh, your view on rubbish? How many times a year do you agendaize this? May I listen? How many times a year do you put this on the agenda? Now, when you talk about economic, this is a, a caveat can be used for young folks. But you go put all out of the country to places like Haiti instead of building economics here. Now, this is the city council. This is why I say you got to get control of this thing. This is your city council. This could have been done. Now, we pay for weeds in Texas on two lots. Now, the weed rebate is making money. But you won't get nobody to go out there. I have cleaned that off when Timor owned that lot where Mercedes Benz is located now. These people can get their young kids and go out, but these people can't pay that that's a contract for somebody got a tractor in the neighborhood. It's a contract. You got those people addressed. You can agree with those people the same way your lots. Dale, the corner of 37 and 2nd Avenue, across the street, and up to the alley on 37, those are fellow government, your job, your lots. They don't never cut it. Why? Because when they scrape them off, they put a gravel in there and a treatment that it won't grow weeds no more. So why can't you tell these people that you do the same thing to private lots and charge them? They'll get this thing in hand because the train is coming. Okay. Economic, this is part of economic development. You ain't got nothing here but utilities to raise and stuff put on uh, for more money to be paid out as you service. Give the young people something to do with their hands. I'm going to be meeting with somebody about the water meters, trying to get a young kid a contract over there. But what are the people that you call neighborhood associations doing with the council? Nothing. You don't have one of those people coming here that's a neighborhood association that we can identify what they file with IRS. Jordy, that should be on up, file sir. that we know what they're doing and how they're doing it, Dale, because they're going to come. Thank you, Mr. Worthy. Uh, Councilmember Carr, you spoke uh, a moment ago, I think that took over. Councilmember Ashby. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to point out one thing. I know in, unless you're um, like the mayor and you just want to say rubbish because it makes you feel British and it's 
fun to say. Uh, this item, we did get a couple calls in our office about items that were listed on here, and I just want to point out that you know I represent an area that has a lot of growth still to happen, which is a nice way of saying there are a ton of weeds in a lot of lots, and uh, it doesn't mean anything other than that they have weeds that they need to cut down. So it's not um, rubbish-filled yards. It's just weeds on vacant lots a lot of the time. And so just to answer the question that we received, and uh, our code enforcement team under Carl is doing such a great job. Both of these guys work really hard, and I appreciate you very much and just wanted to answer that question for anybody who might be tuning in tonight to, to hear about all of the rubbish in our districts. It's a serious subject. Absolutely. So it is. It absolutely is. So there are motion in the second. We did it already. already. And there isn't a need for another one. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Very good. Let's move on to item nine, which is um, the Alhambra Corridor Special Planning District. Is this an item of controversy? Okay. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to waive the staff presentation unless it's necessary uh, and open the public hearing, close the public hearing, and accept the item. Uh, you know, Remy, you've done a great job. Remy, have you prepared a long time for this presentation? <laughs> no, that's fine. Is that okay? And Mr. Mayor, this, this item will be coming back in a couple weeks in the form of the Central City Specific Plan. It's part of remedying the Specific this. Plan. Yep. I understand. Very good. So you'll get your shot. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. There's no public testimony. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Very good. We move to our final item of the uh, evening before we get to the council comments and certainly a unanimous adjourn in memory. Um, Um, we, we move to item 10, the promise zone update. Williams, good, good evening. evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Tyrone Roderick Williams, Director of Development at the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency and Director of the Sacramento Promise Zone. I'm here tonight along with our Promise Zone team and some of our Promise Zone partners to give you an uh, update, a 2017 review. In 20 15, we met in this chamber to launch the Sacramento Promise Zone. In less than three years, the Promise Zone can document its engagement in helping bring over $66 million to the city, to organizations and partners who are carrying out the work in a cross-sector collaborative. As part of our Promise Zone team, I'd like to um, introduce to you and have them stand as I call them. Julius Austin, who is our Promise Zone Coordinator. Ken Doctor, our VISTA leader. He's from Houston, Texas, serving with us. Alicia Gomes from Boston, serving with us. I, in his absence, I want to acknowledge Alphonse Wilfred uh, from Boston, who recently started his first job in economic development last Monday. Also, Angela Cow from Sacramento, and Yi Kao here in Sacramento. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for your dedication to our community and all that you are doing. Appreciate it. When we were, thank you, we, when we were designated a Promise Zone, it did not come with any automatic funding. What it did come with was five AmeriCorps VISTAs to assist us and a federal liaison to help us navigate the very complicated uh, process of attracting and working with federal agencies. The Promise Zone um, currently has a po population of approximately 127,000 residents, a poverty rate of 34%, third grade reading level at only 37% of third graders currently reading at grade level, and life expectancy in the Promise Zone is less than uh, life expectancy outside of the Promise Zone. We focused on five major areas, education, jobs, economic development, health, and sustainable community revitalization. That includes housing, safety, and art and cultural expression. We've got a number of, of accomplishments. Uh, I will quickly highlight some of them tonight. We are planning a third year anniversary celebration in May, and all of you will be getting information about that. 
One of the key parts of the Promise Zone is really connecting Sacramento with the resources of the federal government. And we, this year we've been able to work with HUD, even with our new regional administrator, and we were able to host Matthew Hunter, who is the Assistant Deputy Secretary of HUD. He oversees all of the urban Promise Zones, and our Sacramento Promise Zone was his first visit, and he will be returning with his staff. We've also been working to look at increasing jobs and cross-sector collaboration. Part of that is the first of its kind in the country called the Financial Institution Partnership Opportunity, or FIPO. It's where we started with four lenders who came together to pool their resources together to support an organization that was providing job training to have maximum impact. That first uh, organization that was selected was Grid Alternatives. And Grid Alternatives is involved in providing training for in, um, solar energy installation. We're also working to expand education and outreach programs. And we partnered with the National Society of Black Engineers, Women Engineers, and Professional Engineers to launch the STEM Seek Summer Camp. And we'll be showing a brief video in just a minute. In addition to our work with Grid Alternatives, and uh, our STEM activities, we've been working to, with SMUD and looking at how to increase the opportunities for uh, efficiency and affordable energy. The Sacramento Municipal Utility District has committed over $16 million in the next 15 years in upgrades for energy efficiency packages that may include deep in energy retrofits, weatherization, and rooftop solar for households. In addition to the work that SMUD is doing for energy, they are our corporate, one of our major corporate sponsors for the SEEK program. We've been also working with Crocker and uh, it, it, attracting additional resources from the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences. We're working with Sac State in expanding um, educational opportunities off the campus as well as the campus. And as we look forward to the future, there are a number of really uh, great opportunities to connect. We are currently working to make sure that we submit the Opportunity Zone application to the California Department of fi Finance. Uh, we're also working uh, with a number of bills that are currently passing through the Senate and the Assembly that support cross-sector collaboration in, in the Promise Zones. Mr. And Williams? I want to ask you specifically on the prior slide about um, this concept of opportunity zones, um, which um, at least uh, on the inside here is getting a lot of attention and interest about what that might bring to the promise zone and, and areas of Sacramento. Can you talk about that at all? Sure. The opportunity zones are um, based on census tracts that are identified by the- Sorry, I'm sorry. Its derivation is the Federal Tax Reform Act from 2017, correct? Yes. A and it provided what? It provided the opportunity for businesses that invest in specifically identified census tracts to be able to defer their payment of taxes or contribute those funds into a pool for which that pool of funds then could be designated to support projects within those designated census tracts. Different form of tax increment, in other words. It's sort, a different form, of. or new market tax credits. The program is really closely designed to resemble new market tax credits. And what could its value be in the promise zone if it were fully implemented, these, these opportunity zones? Well, Based on the fact that it's a private sector investment tool, um, numbers that have been kicked around are trillions of dollars over time, depending on uh, the ability of those areas, cities, and projects to attract uh, and leverage those funding capabilities. We'd be satisfied with one trillion, okay? Go ahead, Very continue. Good. Well, as I mentioned, part of our efforts regarding uh, Promazone revolve around STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. At this time, I'd like to show a brief video highlighting the SEEK summer camp, which was held last summer in partnership with Sac City Unified. Pre this I'm presentation sorry? is that was 15, we have 15 minutes allotted, correct? So I just want to make sure that we're yes. keeping track of time. Uh -huh. Are you 
free program for elementary school employees. It's a uh, basic engineering concept. And the real exciting part of Friday is a competition day where all the different grades are to compete within their grade and um, basically showcase all that they're learning. SEEK is a partnership between the National Society of Black Engineers, the Sacramento Promise Zone, the Twin Rivers and Sacramento City Unified School District, and corporate partners like SMUD. The program focuses on STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math content. It's through programs like SEEK that we're continuing our work to partner with community groups to educate kids who may not otherwise have those opportunities in the past. And while we may be training the SMUD workforce of the future and priming our pipeline, it's not just about us. We are truly helping to introduce these kids to a whole new world of possibilities. I'm so appreciative of SMUD, and I'm so appreciative of the other partners that see as their goal and their mission, educating and training young people because you're training the future SMUD workers. I want to be a nuclear engineer. I want to work with chemicals, like a scientist. We want to make engineering a mainstream word. Um, we want minority students to see themselves as engineers or know what engineering is. There's a vast world of different engineering disciplines, and SEEK for us is really the pipeline, the beginning of uh, this exploration about what's possible for students. First day I came to pick him up, I walked in, looked in the class, and he's working on a, a MacBook Air. I was like, Jordan, what were you guys doing on the MacBook Air? He goes, yeah, we were learning about coding. This year in Sacramento, they studied the glider, uh, they did coding, and they did the gravity cruiser. So it's hands-on, it's trial and error, it's, uh, it's building something, it's uh, failing, it's figuring out why it failed, putting it back together. The complicated part of building a gravity cruiser is to make it go a certain speed, because if it goes too fast, it'll flip over, and if it goes too slow, it will just stop. They use as their teachers, what we call our college mentors. So they are looking at college students across the country who are engaged in science, math, engineering, technology, and teaching, and provide summer internship opportunities for those students to be the leaders and the teachers in the class. And so it turned out throughout the camp that about 85% of the students who are mentored come from the Sacramento region or are attending Sacramento colleges. That is unique. No other city that has a seat camp has expressed and exhibited that commitment to its local college students. So our students, who are generally from underrepresented communities, see individuals who look like them, who they can relate to. I'm happy because they're happy, because they built it. And when they see their product go six or eight feet down the track, it's like, wow, we did that. We built this toy. We engineered this toy. Not that we built it, we engineered it. My passion for working with these kids in the seat would be definitely just open the minds of these young people and just not to know, like, the world, there is no limit. They are the engineers. Engineers are people who create solutions, and they have the power to do that themselves. I promise you they will never forget this three-week-long process. They made presentations that sometimes adults can't even do and speak about engineering concepts and different topics and use the vocabulary words that they've learned all within a week. And so I'm hoping that with all the things he's learning through the SEEK program, even if it's not in engineering, he's going to know that he's capable of more. Knowledge is power. That's something that can never be taken away from you. That's what I learned, is that it's power. And you can't, they can't erase it from your mind. I'd like to thank you, Mayor, for your support of the program and uh, say thank you to Vice Mayor Steve Hansen for his financial contribution to help make SEEK STEM Summer Camp 2018 a reality. I'd like to bring to the stage, uh, the podium, um, one of our partners uh, who's participating in the program uh, from the Sacramento Regional Conservation Corps. One of our efforts is looking at how to create jobs for youth. Uh, Mr. David Demers, the Executive Director of the Sacramento Regional Conservation Corps is here. I'd like for him to stand so we can acknowledge him and also invite Mr. Kobe Gross to the podium to share with you his experiences uh, through the Conservation Corps. 
Thank you, guys. Um, awesome. First things first, you guys got to bear with me here. It's the first time doing this, so. Oh, take your <laughs> time. Just don't be nervous. All right, all right. Take a deep breath. You'll be great. Um, good evening. My name is Kobe Gross, and I am a graduate of the Sacramento Regional Conservation Corps Youth, Youth Build Program. Before I came to the SRCC, I was raised by my mother and stepfather in and around Sacramento since I was eight years old. My family and I lived in Oak Park since I started high school. When we didn't have much money, and it wasn't always easy at home, but we got by. I was a student at Hiram Johnson and American Legion High School. I left school at 17 to start working in construction, but I was 60 credits short of my diploma. I joined the SRCC in September of 2016 to complete my high school diploma and joined the Youth Build program to get a job in construction. It made it easier to go to school when I could go to work at the same time. The program allowed me to work a couple days a week at first and more as I progressed in school. In June of 2017, I entered the Youth Build program. My instructor, Ralph Ernest, from the Northern California Construction Training and Sandy Waterhouse kept me on track and made sure that I was getting the training I needed to get ready to join one of the trade unions. While in Youth Build, I received the following certifications. The OSHA 8 certification, the OSHA 10 certification, the OSHA 30 certification, my flagger certification, my Hilti Power Actuated Tool certification, my forklift certification, and my CPR and first aid certification. I graduated my high school, with my high school diploma in September of 2017 and completed the Youth Build program in December of 2017. If I hadn't come to the SRCC, I don't think I would have had the chance to join the union, and I'm not sure what my work opportunities would have been. In February 2018, I joined the Drywall Lathers Local Union 9109, where I work as a stalker scrapper and earn about $16 an hour. My dream is to continue in the drywall industry as a union worker and eventually transition over to the Carpenters Local 46. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to let you guys talk to me, or let you, let me talk to you guys. You, you, you did a great job. <laughs> What's that? Yes, you, you did such a good job, you wanna come back? <laughs> Sorry. Well, this concludes our presentation. We're planning for our third year anniversary. As I said, you'll get more information about that. Um, I and my Promazone team and partners are available for any questions or, uh, that you may have. Thank you all for your support. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Um, let's hear from, we do have two uh, members of the public who want to testify in this item. So I have Robert Copeland and then Mac Elworthy. This may be shocking to the city council, but I approve of this. Uh, I approve. I like, I like to ask a few questions. How many people are actually in the construction trades or uh, employed as an engineer or getting trained as engineers or construction workers? I think that would be important uh, uh, information to know. Mm -hmm. And how, uh, I think they, sh they, they should expand this, to tell you the truth. Yeah. That's all I got to see. I approve this. <laughs> well, there we go. We must be on to something here. Here's Mac Elworthy. Mr. Worthy, I think you too should approve this. <laughs> you know, uh, huh? Dale, I, I don't know where your professional thinking at in this SHRA, professional thinking. We go from property, kids reading at a third grade level, and when we jump across here and we talk about engineer, somebody lying here. How many of those, how many classes over there on business English to write a note in business math to know how math works? You don't have them. Where's your accounting procedures? What is over there for opportunity for minorities to go into business and you can't even sell drugs here? Who's lying? These are the things that I want to talk to the Department of Justice about when they get here. If it ain't in the pipeline, this is part of the sanctions. Seal this money off because it's being misused. Smurd, I've asked for audit on Smurd, and you know, uh, Smurd is the same type of entity that the League of California Cities 
We're not SMUD, by the but way. But where's that money going? You're right, SMUD was up on the same here, that the money comes from SMUD. We want to know where is, else is that money going. Do I have to go to IRS like I went on Lady California City? Hundreds of pages of stuff. I shouldn't have to do that. This should be done by the city. The money that you're spending, because that's people paying utilities. But you'll play a game on education. We're going to educate these people because they are in a property neighborhood. This is how you lied for the past 40 years. I heard about this stuff in 1955. You bought up the poor man's neighborhood and changed the zoning of it, and they ain't got nothing, but yet it's still you're sitting here saying you're going to help them. You're lying. Dale, wake up. You was over there when the city of Lincoln, California said, lob it that 11% of self tax, tax money. You was over there. You know what that was about. Wake up, Dale. You can make a change because you know the history of that money. When they changed from the pact, you got babies out here. Don't even know what a, a tax means. Where's the address in that neighborhood? Because they don't go to meetings. You don't even invite them. Invite them here to talk. Your time is up. You going to quit lying soon? Okay. More speakers. Oh, God. Vice Mayor Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, I just wanted to thank SHRA and Tyrone for all the work on this uh, project. I still remember when you guys came to me in, uh, it must have been 2015, is that when we first applied? And you weren't sure if the council would support the application. And, you know, there was nothing but opportunity in it for us. So thank you for grabbing the bull by the horns and really leading the effort. The results are very um, encouraging and I think meaningful, uh, definitely from the people we heard from tonight, including uh, this wonderful young man who now has a job and is uh, doing great things with his life. I did just want to come back to this um, STEM camp because it's serving kids citywide. Uh, one of the locations, or the location is in my district, but um, Tyrone is a very good arm twister. And as you know, it's very hard to get money out of me for almost anything, but I did out of the one-time youth funds that we got, commit $5,000 to helping with the STEM camp funding because they're out there knocking on doors, trying to raise money to fund this program from private sector. I thought it was so important, especially as we try to get underserved community the opportunity to get that, um, those experiences like we've um, funded through the uh, mayor's office with the Rails grants uh, with Square Root Academy and Nicholas Hastings. Um, things like we've done with Washington Elementary, creating that STEAM program. So I just encourage my colleagues, if you believe in science, technology, engineering, Mr. Guerra, arts and math, that you uh, consider joining me in helping to fund this great summer camp for uh, kids that might, might otherwise not get exposed to this important information. So congratulations on the work and the leadership. What does it cost to run the STEM camp? The cost? It's a three-week um, STEM camp. The cost is $1,000 per student. So the more money we had, the more students we could serve, even in, at different site locations? Yes. The first year, we had two site locations, one in Twin Rivers at the school and one in Sac City. And how many students did that cover again? Altogether, it was uh, approximately 190 students. Uh, our goal is 300 students. Um, and $190,000, essentially. Okay. Well, we ought to trying to dramatically expand those opportunities I mean and you ought to you ought to provide a reach goal it's maybe even higher than 300 and those we got to figure out how we how we expand this I mean this is in collaboration with our school districts by the way maybe 50/50 yes. funding that kind of thing and let's go well, we welcome that opportunity and welcome to work with any of you Ella if you can direct any potential uh, sponsors to assist Currently, we are, are approximately at almost at $100,000 for 2018. Our goal, that would mean 100 students. Our goal was a minimum 150. So we have not met the goal yet, but maybe with some assistance from you all, our uh, corporations that you could direct our way, we'd be more than happy to contact them and share the information with them. Okay, well, it's very worthy. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Carr. Yes, uh, Tyrone. First of all, I want to congratulate 
you and Lachelle and SHRA on the program in the Promise Zone. It was not well understood at the time because of the uh, contiguous demands of the boundaries for the Promise Zone, uh, why those boundaries were drawn. And a lot of communities uh, felt left out when they were not included in the boundary. The whole time you assured me and everyone else that even though we may not be in the boundary, the programs from the Promise Zone would serve everyone. And this is a good example of that. Uh, and it's something to be advertised, that the Promise Zone is serving the whole city, the whole region. Uh, second thing, on a personal note, just want to congratulate you for getting appointed to the Advisory Commission for the Public Utilities Commission. It's quite an honor. Thank you, sir. All right. Congratulations, wonderful. Uh, Councilman Harris. Hi, Rowan, you might as well jump back up. <laughs> so can you explain to me in a little bit more detail the interplay between uh, SRCC and Northern California Construction Training and the Promise Zone Program? Um, I have um, Mr. Dave Demers, who's the Executive Director of the Regional Sacramento Conservation Corps. I think uh, his, it is his organization that is working directly with them through his uh, youth build and other programs. I'd like to defer if, with your approval to him. He's here in the, in the chamber. Sure, come on up, Dave. Thank you, Tyrone. Um, uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, the question um, as it relates to the relationship between SRCC and Northern California Construction Trades, um, we, we actually, from the time we wrote our original youth build uh, contract uh, or grant with the Department of Labor, we sought the, the best construction training program in the, uh, in the Sacramento area um, and reaching out to local employers, local contractors, uh, NCCT was identified as the place where uh, they would prefer their new employees to be trained. And so we went after them and we reached out to them and asked them to come and do our training. So currently we have two trainers from NCCT. We have a, a carpenter, um, I think he's a fifth year carpenter, um, apprentice um, that is a trainer for us and we have we just started with a brand new um, uh, laborer uh, trainer who's been 27 years in the labor union um, those uh, men do the training for our youth um, and ensure that our youth are getting trained to the level that the uh, that the trades require um, it's uh, it's actually really important we put over a dozen young men and women into the trades in the last year um, specifically because of the relationship with the, between NCCT and the SRCC I'm really proud of the relationship that we have with them you know, it's, it's really great. So you're two of the best organizations that I would be able to name in the Sacramento area. And I'm really uh, glad that this young man was able to avail himself of the services. To me, it really underscores the need for more vocational education in our area, which, which is truly an unmet need and something that I would like to focus on a little bit more in the future. Um, you know, NCCT, we brought in volunteers for, uh, to work on our homeless triage shelter as they built all the privacy partitions. Uh, it's just a tremendous outfit and full disclosure, I'm on their board. But, um, you know, the Regional Conservation Corps has also assisted me in many projects throughout my district. So I just really wanted to thank you for presenting and wish you all the best, you know, in your career, but also to underscore that there are opportunities for people you know, to get into the construction trades already existing in Sacramento, so they should contact SRCC and NCCT if they're interested. Thanks. Totally agree. Councilmember Jennings. David, you can stay up. Um, so I'm looking at a team um, between Tyrone and David and Lachelle that has put together some incredible programs, and I just want to give all of you your due credit for being the leaders of putting together programs like this. I'm looking at a parent who is smiling and I can't take that smile off her face. She was filming her son up there speaking in front of us and the smile was on her face the whole time. So I can't even tell you how many more parents that you've made proud of the work that you've done in providing these kinds of programs for them. Uh, to Kobe, you did an outstanding job at the mic. The only thing you didn't do was drop the mic and we appreciate that. <laughs> So um, good job, you know, the more practice you get, uh, the better you'll be, but you are a true leader. You know, you made some decisions early in life that 
you, you decided weren't the best decisions for you, and now you've made some other decisions that have allowed you to graduate from high school and move into the trades and move into a career. And I heard you not only talk about what you're doing today, but I, I heard you talk about what you want to do tomorrow. And so for all the mentors, the team that you introduced early, uh, earlier, for all the mentors that are working with our kids, the mentors who are out there uh, providing the example for them that it can be done for someone who looks just like them, I want to give them their applause as well, um, even though they're not here. But I want to acknowledge them for the work that they've done. These kids are our next workforce. And somewhere it said it in the video, we are training our workforce for tomorrow. And, and that's what you're doing. The, the kids that are getting the SEEK training and, and looking at you know, engineering and, and, and science and math and all those other things that we're training them, how to show up on time, how to dress for success, how to communicate with each other and work with each other. We're training our workforce for tomorrow, so you are doing incredible work. And we should expand it. We've got to find a way to expand it. We've got to learn how to work better together to expand it. And so you have my commitment that I will work with you to find ways that we can take 190 and make it 390 or 590. Um, but we will, I think all of us will work with you in order to make that happen because we've got a lot of programs that happen in the summertime. Too many of them are recreation-based. They're not engineering-based. They're not math-based. They're not science-based. So these are the kind of programs we want our kids to move into and be able to pay jobs that pay 16. You say 16 now? I'm going to have to come to you for a loan. <laughs> anyway, good job. Congratulations to all of you. More to come, more opportunity. Thank you so much. This is a report. Uh, we don't need to take a vote on this, so thank you very much. That um, ends the formal uh, agenda here. We now have council comments. I'm just going to kick it off here real quickly, uh, and I'll let the members speak more extensively. But um, we lost um, a dear Sacramentan this week, someone who achieved so much in such a short life uh, for our community, and that was Ali Yousefi. And um, it's just amazing um, the outpouring of grief, um, but just feeling about what this young man meant um, represented sort of the essence and epitome of this renaissance feeling we all have about our city and its possibilities. and was not afraid to take risks, was not, inf not, not afraid to be bold, was not afraid to say we can create the right kind of mixed use and, and work more workforce housing for, uh, for our community. And on a personal level, he was just a kind, kind man. And our community genuinely grieves uh, for his family, um, for his wife, for his parents, um, but for ourselves, I think, too because um, he represented all the good things that we want for our city. So I wanted to kick that off. Oh, the vice mayor, uh, let go next, and then uh, Council Member Ashby after that. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, indeed, uh, Sacramento lost a giant. Um, <clears throat> I, I know that he has some uh, friends in the audience, too, in the Housing Authority, because they work together a lot. So I, I don't want to forget that. But for me, Ali was a friend because we kind of came up together in a way. He had just come back to Sacramento as I was getting engaged in uh, the downtown partnership and had just moved to Alkali Flat. And um, honestly, I was talking to Bay Mary last night because there was a little impromptu memorial. And my first memory that I can trace back to Ali was he and Bay taking on uh, the big developers over the 700 block and 800 block because, you know, uh, these big shots, they wanted to redo it all and they were convinced that these two young guys didn't know what they were doing and there's this big showdown here at the council and lo and behold, the little guys, the people who everybody had sort of written off, got the council to decide for them to redo the 700 block. And, and um, you know, what's really sad is that we're sort of on the precipice of finalizing that project, which has lingered and really um, been a painful project in many ways um, with the demise of redevelopment. But the thing about Ali, any of you who got to work with him or know him, even in the midst of cancer, he was the most positive 
person. He almost glowed with this sense of peace and he focused on what he needed to focus on and he tried to block out everything else. I had lunch with him uh, in early uh, February and you know, somebody with such courage and hope and he just, he wanted everybody else to feel okay. You know, and that was the really surprising thing. He could have been self-centered. He could have focused on his own pain and his own suffering. But um, he, want, he wanted to send this message that he was hopeful, that if anybody would beat this, it would be him. And in the end, it's that example that I think we want to live up to. Um, last night, his, uh, his father and some of his family came out to the impromptu um, uh, remembrance and about a hundred other people showed up to artists, uh, people from the development community, uh, people who just knew him as friends. And the thing was, it was on the uh, deck at the warehouse artist lofts. Some of you were there when we celebrated that project, or even broke ground on it. And the thing that I um, think is important to leave us with as a memory is that whenever Ali spoke at a project, he always talked about his father. He talked about how he was trying to live up to his father's example and that he, um, he admired his father. His father was such a big part of his life and you know, having to say goodbye to somebody uh, too soon, too young and with so much promise uh, is painful. But I think the only real antidote to that pain is to carry on his work, Mayor. Mm -hmm. And um, we're trying to do that with a few of those projects, the 800 block, the Bellevue, uh, with 1717S, uh, the Market 515 project on R Street. And, you know, he was responsible for a lot beyond the development world, but affordable housing was his passion, helping people um, feel um, like they had a place in the community, even when the powers that be may not always look them in the face and acknowledge them. We need to continue that legacy, and so um, it's my honor to join with you and the rest of the council in adjourning in his memory. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Malik, were you Councilmember Ashby? Yeah. This is a tough one. Yeah. Um, Ollie was my friend, too, and I have lots of great memories of him. The day that he got the keys, that he and Bay got the keys to 700 block, they were, they, they literally had a sleepover. They <laughs> called Michelle Killey and I, and we went down there, it was my chief of staff at the time. And they were so excited to walk us through with their flashlights, and it really was just like this dark, dusk, nothingness, but these two boys, uh, you know, they didn't see what I saw, right? I, I saw two excited guys. They saw the future of Sacramento in, in those walls, and what they were gonna deliver to their city, both you know, sons of immigrants who um, were born and raised here and went to great schools, and Ali who went to an Ivy League school and then, but couldn't wait to come back. And I, I said this to a, another person that asked me, but if you would have asked Ali Yousefi, would you rather be a big time developer in downtown New York City in Manhattan or a developer in Sacramento, California, it would have taken him two seconds to answer that question. It would have been Sacramento. Without a doubt, he he loved this city wholeheartedly, and you know it's written all over his projects. When he wanted me to tour the artist lofts over there on R Street, and they're fabulous, but n nothing could compare to how excited Ali was about the inscriptions that the original you know construction crew had written on the beams on the ceiling. So he wanted to be sure to frame those out so that everybody who walked through could see the original workers who worked on this project years and years ago. And I mean, just to care that much about every detail of every little project um, f for me, and, and Steve and I both are really close to Ali. In fact, when we talked, we started crying on the phone with each other because it's just so hard to say goodbye to him. And Steve said this, but I think it's, it's so true. We'll never know what we lost. We'll never really know because he gave us so much in his first 35 years, but you know, we should have had another 40 or more with him. And I have no idea what he could have done in our city in that time, but I know it would have been spectacular. And he, he, it's just, it's too much too soon. And, um, and I'm really sorry for that. And then on a, like on a personal note, 
When you run for office, you put yourself out there to the world, and you don't really know, right? You don't know if people, when you're walking on doors, will, will slam the door in your face, and when you call somebody and ask them for a check, you don't know if they'll hang up on you or yell at you or whatever. And Ollie, for me, was somebody that made me feel stronger. And I know he believed in me. He made that really clear. We had a deal, um, but he, he can't fulfill his half now. But I promised him and his dad that I, I would fulfill my half to Ali. And I just, you know, when you lose somebody like that that makes you feel stronger, it, it, it chips away at your own strength. And so for me, this last week was a, a direct hit in the form of Ali Yousefi. So I will miss him a lot, but I will see him everywhere in the renovation of Sacramento. Um, by the way, he loved Natomas too. He had big ideas for the arena reuse and would call me weekly with his ideas. So I will think of him every, every step of that, that journey. Mayor, I have a couple other um, announcements. Do you want to, me to do those right now? Sure. It's fine. We take it out of order. Uh, okay. I want to thank the Kings for um, helping me celebrate women last week. They had a women's night. They made an international women's night in the NBA, and we had a wonderful time there. And they helped us honor Luella Johnston. They showed a video of her. They honored the women of City Hall and, and our partners here. And, um, and they also honored Rivka Sass and Jesse Ryan and Ruthie Bolton Holyfield as their Women of the Year for their just amazing contributions to the city of Sacramento. I want to thank them for that. I also want to note that Councilmember Warren is on a panel tomorrow. If you guys don't know about this, he'll never say it because he doesn't doesn't brag about himself. But he'll be tomorrow on a center at the uh, Center on Race and Immigration and Social Justice at Sac State. On this panel is also his friend Danny Glover and uh, Gus Newport, who's the mayor of Berkeley. Oh, yeah, former mayor. I'm sorry, former mayor. And then um, a professor from the Ethnic Studies Program, and then uh, Dr. Luther Castillo Harry, who is the Honduras uh, doctor that Alan is friends with. And, and they're going to talk about the crisis in Honduras, which is really uh, a, a just an extraordinary story happening in our world right now. And Alan has taken this very heroic position on the things that are happening there, even escorting folks back into that country to make sure that they would be safe. And I think he deserves a lot of credit, and I'm going to send my team over to hear him. And I posted this up on social media because I'm really proud of him, and I hope that people will go, go listen to that panel tomorrow because I think it will be good. Also, tomorrow is the National School Walkout Day, and I'm sure some of you are going to schools. I, too, will be in my district at a high school that is going to walk out so we can support these young people in uh, their effort to address gun violence and get some sensible gun control regulations nationally. And I'm honored to do that, as I'm sure all of you are as well. And then Monday, probably about half of this council, Mayor Steve and Jeff and I will all be at the state of Natomas. Uh, and we will be giving some updates on what's happening in our neck of the woods up there, what we all work on together all the time. And so I want to make sure folks know about that. It's around the noon hour. If you're interested, you call any one of the three of our offices and get more information. And then lastly, my last item here, Mayor, is a follow-up. It's a request to the city attorney for the November ballot. Matt, uh, I need to bring some language back to this council. It has been discussed before, but I think I need to make the official ask of you for a ballot initiative with charter amendment language to make the auditor a charter officer. Then the council can vote it up or down, but I'm, I need to ask you to bring that back for us. It has already made its way through the appropriate committees, but, but needs to be voted on by them to see if it goes on the ballot. And uh, that's it for me, thanks. Thank you so much. Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. I, I also have a few words about Ali Yousefi. Um, Ali was a person who, even if you didn't know him well, you felt totally embraced and felt like you were his dear friend almost immediately. He had that kind of personality. He and I spoke extensively about transit-oriented development and about modular building. In fact, he, we made an appointment to go down to Mare Island to look at the biggest factory in America to build modular housing for permanent supportive housing and just affordability by design. 
It was really great to have a friend like that to talk about the building trades, and he truly embodied the future of Sacramento in my mind. Um, I have to say, I really look forward to what he would achieve because it seemed almost boundless in terms of the building world. So it is a huge loss for Sacramento, and I'm sure for all of us personally. And as Angelique said, this is really a tough one. He was just an elegant human being, and he will be missed deeply. So um, that being said, I did want to mention that we had a parade on Northgate Boulevard last Saturday, the first time in 30 years, and it really warmed my heart to see how this community came to life and felt pride in itself. So it was celebrating the Thomas Youth Baseball and Girls Fast Pitch Softball, but it was more than that. It was about the community coming together and, and again, really feeling proud of itself for the first time in a long time. So we look forward to doing that every year. I was really happy the mayor showed up and uh, Phil Cerna managed to make it. So it was really a great celebration of Natomas generally, but specifically Northgate and Gardenland, where it was held. And, uh, you know, closing off Northgate Boulevard, a, th a major thoroughfare, was no mean feat, but we pulled it off. And uh, last uh, announcement is the, the hot spot this Friday, March 16th, from 7 to 11 at Rio Tierra, which happens to be the school where we ended our parade, and uh, we threw out our first pitch for Natomas Youth Baseball. Thank you. It was a great parade. Sure was. Councilmember Warren. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have one comment, um, and it is a uh, announcement for the grand opening, or excuse me, the um, groundbreaking for the new grocery outlet. We had planned to do it last week or the week prior, and it was it had gotten rained out, and so it was postponed. So we're going to do the groundbreaking for the new grocery outlet on Del Paso Boulevard tomorrow, rain or shine. 10 a.m. at the southeast corner of El Camino and Del Paso Boulevard. Hope to see some of you out there. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Chenier. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to add my condolences to Ali's family, and um, I think everyone has said exactly what needs to be said about who he was. And... Um, I like the word elegant because he was an elegant individual. He was exactly what we are striving for as a community. Um, someone who was willing to take some risks, someone who was bold in their vision, um, and, and just was a very, very kind man. And I, I know that it is a huge loss for our community. And what he did in such a short period of time is something that we will always be able to look at. Um, I love walking down the K Street most days to see the progress on the 700 block. Uh, it was touch and go for a while, and a lot of people on this day has helped make that happen, but uh, it, was, it was his vision. So I, I do have a suggestion, particularly around the 700 block, and I'd ask the city manager's office to uh, bring us back steps to name the street, um, that 700 block after Ali, and whether we do it ceremonial or whether we do it um, as a block, uh, I think that would be a fitting memorial to him that we could all uh, get behind. So I'd ask you to bring that back for us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Um, two quick announcements. We, we do have our Peace Walk this Friday night from New Hope Baptist Church, 5 p.m. We continue to get additional people coming out every week, it, it is a very good um, good walk to take, and that is on um, Sutterville, and right by Highway 99. And then I'll be doing office hours Monday the 19th at Broadway Coffee from 7 to 8 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Carr. Yes, thank you, Mayor. My condolences uh, also go out to Ali and his family. I didn't know him as well as some of the other council members but not long after I was elected, he called and took me on a tour. It was one of the hottest days of the year. And uh, he wanted to show me the buildings that he was working on, uh, the, uh, what he could do with uh, SROs, and he was really proud of what was going on on K Street. And 
it was especially the work of, with the SROs, the single room occupancy, and his compassion for the people who were living there, and his uh, absolute uh, need to see them having decent places to stay, where they didn't have to share a bathroom, didn't have to share a kitchen. He thought it was absolutely critical that uh, we do that as a city. And I was just struck by his compassion for such a young man to be so compassionate towards uh, people and to be so forward thinking in what he was trying to do for the city. Uh, he will definitely be missed. I just have one item. Uh, so some of you might know the council approved a year or two years ago some money for a chain link fence removal in District 8. And we are getting very close to uh, making that happen with the pilot project with four houses. But at the same time, I've asked that, and I can't remember if it was the city manager's office or the city attorney, to come back with a uh, ordinance change through law and ledge, which would uh, not allow any more chain link fences in the front yard. Uh, is one of you two still working on that? First time anybody's heard of it? Councilman O'Connor, uh, I, geez, I hope I get this correct. I believe it's on the log, the long ledge log, if I'm not mistaken, but I'd have to get back to you on that. I will concur that I uh, had seconded Mr. Carr's uh, action here and that I believe it is going to be on the log. Let's check and we'll get back. It's a, it's a very minor change. It's a one word change to the ordinance. So hopefully we can get that soon. I, I wouldn't like any more chain link fences to go up if we're trying to take them down. Okay, let's please check on that and get back to Council Member Carr. Council Member Jennings. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a couple of announcements I wanna make and they're in reference to this Thursday, March 15th, uh, City Hall in your neighborhood will take place uh, at Prairie Elementary School at 6 p.m. And we encourage you to spread the word and stop by. If coming to the neighborhood City Hall is more convenient than coming to City Hall downtown. Uh, also, a Cougar Paint Night uh, party. It's a party and uh, it's a fundraiser uh, for $40. The kids at uh, JFK are going to be going, the marching band will be going to Washington, D.C., so they're doing fundraisers. And so the Cougar Paint Night Party Fundraiser uh, it's going to take place at JFK from 6 to 8 p.m., and you can call my office for more information. Uh, the mayor and I will be throwing first pitches on this Saturday, March 17th at 8.30 for the Pocket Little League opening day. And for more information, you can visit the pocketlittleleague.com website. And then the marching band, again, uh, because they are raising money, are going to have the marching band color run on Saturday, March the 17th, from 9 to 12 p.m., from 12 to 3 p.m. So now you may ask the question, what is a color run? So a color run is an exciting fundraising event. Notice I said exciting. Exciting fundraising event where participants are doused with color while raising funds. Now you can't have a better Saturday than that. I know it's something that you've never done before, and this will be a first time opportunity to get your picture with the mayor and the vice, well, not vice mayor, it's council member, uh, doused with uh, paint while we all go out there on a fun run, raising money for a good cause for the marching band to be able to go to Washington, D.C. I'm not sure the dousing of paint is on my calendar, but that's all right. <laughs> I already did something this week. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. And then finally, um, it was our pleasure to, my pleasure, and the mayor participated as well in the St. Baldrick's um, cancer, childhood cancer awareness. And so our hair, we cut our hair off in order to raise money for the awareness of that. And um, it's something that I want to participate in every year because I think um, we need to bring more awareness and raise more money for research for childhood cancer. And so, Mayor, I thank you for doing it. Uh, I'm glad that I did it as well. And I'm waiting patiently for my hair to grow back. So am I, and I'm worried it won't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Mayor again. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will say I think Mr. Jennings pulls it off a little bit better. But that's only because he doesn't need the sunscreen. 
Anyway, I have a few things for the, for the staff. Um, first, uh, we've been talking, uh, Council Member Shanir and I had a great community meeting last week with people who live on either side of Freeport Boulevard. And uh, the city staff have been working on Vision Zero and the implementation plan for that. One of the components is a complete streets policy. And in the past, we've talked about uh, some updates to our pedestrian crossing guidelines. So I'd like to make that request official. Um, if possible, we could roll it into the uh, Vision Zero Task Force to bring those recommendations on both the complete streets policy, which I think has been pending on the law and ledge log now for three years, something like that, um, and these updated pedestrian crossing guidelines as part of Vision Zero. Um, Second, um, the Arts Commission has been working for a long time on implementing an equity statement in its efforts, and I know that some of those uh, commissioners uh, would like to come and present their equity statement to the council. So without objection, I'd, I'd like that at some point we agendize them for a very short presentation to talk about their work around equity in the arts and their, their new policy statement. And the last thing is um, really a follow-up to what council member Ashby requested from uh, city staff. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to work with you on the charter amendment related to the independent auditor, but I also know that um, when our previous city clerk was here and city attorney that the CAO and the clerk's office had come up with other non-controversial charter changes that were never incorporated into any other thing, so I'd like to ensure that any cleanup we need to do to the charter, that this is probably a good time to do it, especially if it's consistent with, with that work, so. Um, yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Very good. Council Member Guetta. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Um, just a few quick announcements here. Uh, the, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, for coming out to the College Glen uh, oh, and uh, College Greens, Glen Brook Little League. And yeah. uh, great parade. Uh, and I'm also, uh, uh, we had our uh, Parks Commissioner, Tyler Aguilar, out there. I want to thank him. And then also for coming out the Tahoe Talic Little League opening day, too. So it, it was a great weekend. Uh, for Tahoe Park, we're going to have the Easter egg hunt on March 24th at 9 a.m. at Avondale Glen Elder, the Southeast Village Neighborhood Association. They're having their egg extravaganza Saturday, March 31st at 11 a.m. at the Georgetown's Community Center. And uh, the 18th annual Cesar Chavez March is scheduled for Saturday, March 31st, 10 a.m. at Southside Park. Also, Sacktown's 2000 egg, egg hunt will be April 1st at 10.30 a.m. At Prov with Providence Church um, at 60th Street. And with uh, that, Mr. Uh, Mayor and, and fellow council uh, colleagues, I also want to extend my condolences to the family of Ali Yousefi uh, in Paz Descanse and uh, wish their family uh, all our thoughts and prayers. Of course. Thank you so much. And I'll end, uh, I, I guess I have the requirement is uh, that when you travel, you've got to do an AB1234 report. So I spent last week, uh, most of the week, in Washington, D.C., and then Austin, Texas. In Washington, I helped lead uh, a delegation uh, of the Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce, Region Business, and the Sacramento Sierra Building Trades uh, on a uh, advocacy visit to Washington, D.C., both the administrative agencies, executive branch agencies, and of course the Congress. I had one-on-one uh, -on -one sit downs with both of our U.S. Senators, uh, various members of Congress. We talked a lot about infrastructure uh, and immigration. Uh, and um, it was a very productive trip. It, some noted it might have been the only such trip in the country where organized labor and the business community uh, banded together to travel back to advocate together. So I thought that was noteworthy. And I'm only sorry that I couldn't get back for the events of last Thursday uh, and the peaceful rally that uh, occurred. I want to thank all those who participated, all the members and members of the public who participated uh, in that very important exercise of democracy. I'm proud of our community. And then I traveled to Austin, Texas for just a day and a half, really, of the South by Southwest Festival. And all I can say is they've done that for 31 years. And it is, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. It's a music and film festival, but it's also now a civic um, engagement forum. Uh, they gathered mayors from throughout the country, participated in a workforce development panel. But really what I came away with is that why not Sacramento? 
that's the kind of thing that we need to do more of here, right? When we celebrate shutting down Broadway for one Sunday, which is a fabulous thing, and seeing all the happy people, um, bikers and families walking around Broadway, it begs the question, why not 10 times a year? Not just on Broadway, but elsewhere. And that's what South by Southwest uh, sort of represented to me, the, the growing up of Austin in a way that makes it a destination city. And I think that's something that we can aspire to on our terms in our way as Sacramentans. Okay, last, last comment. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Much, Mayor. Um, we made a mistake in that City Hall in your neighborhood in District 7 will not take place at Prairie Elementary School, but will take place at the Robbie Waters Library once again this Thursday at 6 p.m. at the Robbie Waters Library uh, in Pocket Greenhaven. Thank you all very much. Um, in memory of Ali Yousefi, we will adjourn.